All right. Chapter 5, Matthew. We're going through the Sermon on the Mount. Now, remember, Jesus has come to a place where he had just gone through the regions of Galilee, healing the sick and the lame, cleansing lepers, healing the blind. And obviously, when a prophet, a man comes with that kind of power, people are going to flock to him. So multitudes have flocked to him. Again, some for the miracle's sake, some because they hear the, the Messiah's on the scene. Um, who is he? Is he going to usher in the kingdom? Is he going to give the kingdom back to Israel? And there, everybody's just wondering what's going to happen next. Is there, There's this man sent from the Lord doing all this power, doing all these miracles and power. And obviously he has a, a following. Now, he does all of those miracles and all of those things to lead to his teaching. So he can teach people about what heaven's all about, what the kingdom is all about, why he really came into this world. Now remember, at this time, the Pharisees are watching him also. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day, the leaders that basically they taught the law in the synagogues and in the temple day in and day out, week in and week out, and they were kind of the authority of the day when it came to God's word, the Old Testament. Now, when they hear there's a, a Messiah on the scene, they go out also. Just who is this guy? What is he teaching? If he really is the Messiah, they think that they're gonna that he's gonna come and be with them and bless them because they were the religious leaders of the day. So after he does all these miracles and he has this great following, he goes up into a little mountain, probably on a nice day like this, and he starts to teach the people. And they're wondering, what's he going to say? Is he going to teach us about the law? Is he going to teach us about the Ten Commandments in the, uh, the Old Testament? Because that's what they heard week in and week out, week out in that day. Every time they went to, you know, to synagogue, especially the Jewish crowd, the Pharisees and the scribes would teach the law. They would teach the do's and the don'ts of the law over and over again. They had got it down to a science that there was over 600 of them. So as, as he's waiting there to teach the people, all of these people are waiting, what is he going to say? Is he going to side with the Pharisees because they've been the teachers of the law? What is he going to do? And remember last time when I talked about this, I'll bring you up to speed, when he first opens his mouth and teaches them, he starts to teach them about a relationship and an attitude towards God. He's going to get into the Ten Commandments, as you'll see, but he starts to teach them, to explain to them, listen, life is more about rituals. Religion is more about rituals and laws and do's and don'ts. There's a reason why you're here. There's a reason why God created you and he created you because he wants to have a relationship with you. So when he opened up his mouth, and we went through that last time, and I'll read through it, he starts to speak the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes of verses 1 um, through 10, actually through 12, that talk about the blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, right? Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the peacemakers. And he starts to teach them, you want to be blessed of God? God's smiling on you. God's looking on you. You're blessed of God is this, if this is your heart and if this is your attitude. And the people are shocked. The multitudes are there around this mountain. I remember, Jesus was a peripatetic rabbi, which meant he walked around from place to place, and as he did his miracles, his disciples would follow him, and as they followed him, they literally walked behind him, and he'd turn around and he would teach them. So on this occasion, he's got a multitude following him because he had just did all these miracles, and his disciples are walking right behind him, and he goes up a mountain. They wonder, where's he going now? Is he going up to the mountain to pray because he had been known to do that? Well, he turns around on the mountainside. He sits down. He's elevated above the people. Everybody else stands. Practically speaking, he goes up on the mountainside so his voice will carry, so everybody can hear it. He sits down, as a rabbi in that day would do, and he starts to teach the people. And he tells them they're blessed if they have this heart's attitude toward God. Look what he says. Seeing the multitudes, he went up, verse 1, into a mountain. When he was said, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they 
which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now the people hear this and they're shocked. Because they're sitting there thinking he's going to get up there and he's going to start to recite the law and go over the law and condemn the people. You're not holy because of this. You're not holy because of that. You don't give enough. You don't do enough. You don't perform enough. You don't do any of that. They're sitting there thinking that that's what they're going to hear more of because that's what the Pharisees taught. And listen... People flock to churches all over the place, and that's what they're hearing this morning. They're hearing, you want to be good? You want to be accepted of God? Do this, and don't do that. Do this, and don't do that. Now listen, I know the epistles talk about those things. But read the, the first part of the epistles. The epistles are the, you know, the writings of Paul and of Peter. At the end of every epistle, the last two or three chapters, it talks about the way we're supposed to function as Christians, the way we're supposed to treat one another, the things we're supposed to do and don't do. But every first part, the first few chapters of the epistles are about this is what God has done for you. This is how much God loves you. That This is what God did for you. He laid down his life for you. All of that and all of the way we live our lives is as a response to love. Not to earn a relationship, not to earn and get anything from God. He has already given to us everything in Jesus Christ. And that's where we get it backwards sometimes. We walk around and say, God, look what I'm doing now. I'm, you know, I'm coming to church. I come three times a week now. I, I'm doing this and I, I get that done. I don't do this anymore. So surely you owe me now. You owe me some ministry position or you owe me some you know, promotion at my job. And we, No, that's not how it works. God loves you because he loves you because he's your father. And Jesus addresses the attitude of the heart in these verses. All the people, all the multitudes, especially the scribes and the Pharisees who are on looking, have been on looking during his whole ministry, they're sitting there waiting for him to sit there and say, hey, this is what the law says. This is what the law says. Do this. Don't do that. Do this. Don't do that. Now he's going to get to the law in a minute. He's going to explain to them the true heart behind the law. But he starts with the relationship. He goes, listen, is there anybody here who's hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Is there anybody here that really wants to be right with God? Really wants to sin out of their life and wants to have real righteousness in, the, in their life? Is there anybody here like that? He goes, if there's anybody here like that, you're blessed. He goes, is there anybody here in this whole multitude that's mourning and is sorry for their sin in their life? Is there anybody here like that this morning as he preaches to the crowd? If you're mourning... Over your sin, you know what? You will be comforted. He goes, is there anybody out there that's trying to make peace with their fellow man? If that's you, you'll be called the children of God. Is there anybody out there with an attitude of meekness? Is there anybody out there like that? You'll see God. And that's what he's preaching to. He's preaching to the heart. And he's trying to explain to them that, listen, religion isn't about performance the religious do's and the don'ts and the ceremonies in the Old Testament were there to lead you into a relationship with God. And the Pharisees were keeping people away from that. Now, as he addresses the crowd, probably three, 4,000 people there on that day, maybe more. As he addresses the crowd, now listen, there's different hearts that were there. You have the Pharisaical heart. Their heart's sitting there saying, hmm, let him slip up just once in his teaching of the scriptures so we can correct him, so we can show the people we're the true authority. Because we're the holy standard around here. Let us just keep our eye on him so we can see. Once he slips up, we'll be on him so we can get the people to, so what if he's doing miracles, still follow us. Then there's the hearts out there that, hey, he just healed me. I want to see what this guy has to say. Is he really the Messiah? 
Then there's the zealot heart out there that's saying, hey, you know what? Is he going to give the kingdom back to Israel? He says he's the Messiah. Bring in the times of refreshing. Put down the Roman Empire. Be done with them. Blast them from heaven. Let's set up the kingdom. That heart's there. But there were some people there with this heart. There were some people there that were poor in spirit. There were some people there that were mourning over their sin. There were some people there that were merciful. There were some people there, listen, that were hungering and thirsting for righteousness and just wanted to know God. Listen, in every church service, that's the same heart. You say, oh, Pastor Matt, this is a Christian church. We all have that kind of heart. No, you don't. I know you. <laughs> but Jesus knows you. God knows your heart. Sometimes we can get like the Pharisees. Sometimes we can look out at others and say, you know what, I'm just waiting for them to slip up so I can, you know, get on them and jump on them and show them just how holy I am and how unholy they, they you know, they are. And sometimes we can just, you know, want to come to church as a, you know, because we want a miracle. God, just do this miracle in my life. God, if you do this miracle in my life, then I'll serve you. There were those that were waiting to be healed. Listen, Jesus would go and heal multitudes, right? But then on many occasions, he would go and he would just heal one. You know that, right? He'd heal multitudes, he'd heal them all, and then all of a sudden, he'd go and he'd heal, he'd heal one or two. And there are some people that come to church every week with the motive of, hey, you know what? If, you know, when's God going to do this for me? When's God going to do this miracle in my life? When's, God, when's he going to do this for me? What if he doesn't do that miracle? Will you still love him? Will you still serve him? And then there are some that come to church week after week that are broken, that are needy, that are hurting, that are really sorry for their sin, that really want to be more like Jesus. That really mourn. That really are broken for the hearts of their brothers and sisters in Christ. Now God wants us all to be in that state. And I know every one of us fluctuate through all of these different heart attitudes through different areas of our lives. Sometimes we get like Pharisees. Sometimes we get like God, just do a miracle in my life. Sometimes we're broken and needy. But that's the, that's the state we need to be in if we're going to be used of God. God, I need you. I'm sorry for my sin. I need more of Jesus in my life. Please forgive me. Cleanse me. Pick me up. Lord, use me. That's the heart we need to have all the time. Now, it's hard to stay in that spirit. But that's when God can use you. And that's the crowd through the midst of everybody. That's the crowd Jesus is addressing. Because he turns to them. Who does he, who, who does he address? He addresses those who are mourning, those who are poor in spirit, those who have a meek heart, those who have a pure heart, those who are peacemakers, those who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. That's who he's addressing. And then he says to them, verse 13, this is your responsibility. If that's your heart, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. He says to them, to those people there that are really seeking God, you are the salt of the earth. Not the Pharisees. Not the miracle seekers. The ones with the attitude and the heart that really wanted to know God and really were sorry for their sin. He goes, you guys of the salt of the earth. Now listen, the way it's written here, it's you alone. And the next couple of verses, you're the light of the world. You alone are the salt of the earth. You alone are the light of the world. Only you. Let me pass that. That doesn't mean every Christian denomination and every Christian sect that, that, sect that puts a cross up on the church, they're not the light of the world. No. It's only those in the midst of the churches it's only those who are called out who are really hungering and thirsting after righteousness. It's only those who really are peacemakers. It's only those who really have a meek attitude. They're the salt of the earth. Now our job is to go before the Lord and say, Lord, you know what? What kind of Christian am I? Am I turning into a Pharisee? Am I turning into a miracle seeker? Lord, am I still sorry over my sin when I sin? Because when we have that broken state, and when we're in that broken state, that's when God can use us. 
And he says them, your responsibility is to be what? You are the salt of the earth. He says this to the crowd. But if the salt had lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It's thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trodden underfoot of men. Now listen, they were familiar in that day and age with salt. They had the Dead Sea. It was the saltiest sea. It was so buoyant that if you went into the Dead Sea and you tried to you know, sink yourself, you would float because there was just so much salt in the, in the sea. It would hold you up. There were mounds of salt everywhere. And they would use the salt for specific things. Now again, you can do six sermons just on salt, but for time's sake, I'll give you a couple reasons why they use salt. They would take the salt, and again, they didn't have refrigerators, freezers, things of that nature in that day, compressors and condensers. They didn't have those. What they had was salt. So they would take the salt after they were fishing, they would take their catch, and they would pack the fish with salt in and out. It would preserve it until they got it to the marketplace so they could sell it. Make sense? So salt preserves. That's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. Listen, I really believe this with all my heart. The reason why God hasn't judged America already is because there are some Christians still around that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, that really are peacemakers, that really are trying to walk in meekness. You know what? And God preserves this nation, I believe, because of it. That's why it's been preserved so long. I believe that. Listen, salt cleanses, salt stings. When there was wounds, scrapes, cuts, things of that nature, they would use salt to clean out the impurities. Now, as it was cleansing, it would sting, obviously. You know, salt in your wound, salt in your eye. It's painful. It hurts. And what he's saying to them is, you are the salt of the earth. When people see you, if you're really living for me, you know what? It's going to sting sometimes. They might not like to hear what you say or see how you live. You know what? We got the people that drive around. We got the Christians that put the fish on the car. Again, I don't put the fish on the car because I'm a lawbreaker. Forgive me. I can't, I can't keep it down to, you know, isn't it funny? And we'll talk. Maybe I'll get to that later when we get to the, the commandments. But the speed limit says 65. Everyone's doing 71 or 72. If it says 55, you're doing 61, 62. Not the godly people here. You guys do two miles an hour under. But the point he's trying to make here is salt preserves, salt stings, salt cleanses. And listen, people don't like that sometimes. Sometimes when you stand up for Jesus and you tell people the truth, you know what? It hurts and it stings. I'm so glad somebody told me the truth. I'm so glad somebody told me about Jesus, told me that I needed to repent, told me that if I didn't, I was going to hell. And you know what? That stung. But then it led me to repentance. That hurt. And listen, the Bible talks about if we see our brother and sister overtaken in a fault, if you're really spiritual, you go to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. What does that mean? That means if you really love God and if you really love his people, and we have these people that walk around and say, oh, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to say nothing to them. You know what, I don't want to offend them. I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to offend them. Well, listen, then you're not loving them. Then you're not loving them. And you got to check your heart. It says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. That means don't go there like a Pharisee and say, hey, look what you're doing. Do things the way I do things. You go there and you say, hey, you're supposed to love Jesus. You, you can't live this way. You can't treat your wife like that. You can't act like that. You can't do those things. And it stings. It hurts. You, everybody should have somebody in their life that can tell them the truth like that. Really. Jesus said to them, you are the salt of the earth. Again, not everybody there. Just those who were really hungering and thirsting for God. Just those. Listen, in every church, everybody there that names the name of Christ is not the salt of the earth or the light of the world. Don't get mad at me. He's going to say it. He's going to tell you right here. So Pastor Matt, I received Jesus. I'm the light of the world. I'm the salt of the earth. No, you ain't. He's going to tell you who is. Now, we all have the potential in us, if you love Jesus, to be the salt and the light. But look what he says. 
You are the salt of the earth, you alone. But if the salt had lost its savor, where would shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. After they used up the salt, and the salt loosed, lost its saltiness, it didn't preserve anymore. It couldn't cleanse anymore. What they would do is they would take it and they would throw it into the middle of the road. They, they were careful not to throw it into a garden or on the grass because it would decay and destroy the grass. And I venture to say this, a Christian that won't let God make them be the salt of the earth, they're the most miserable people on the planet because they get enough of Jesus in their lives, listen, not to go too far away from him, but they get enough of the world not to go full on for Jesus and the salt loses its saltiness and they end up miserable and they end up causing decay and division in churches and pain in people's lives. Listen. So they would take that salt, they would throw it out in the road, made sure it was in the middle of the road, so the horses, the cattle, the people would stomp it into dust. We need to ask ourselves the question, has the salt lost its savor? Are we still salty Christians? Do we want to be salty Christians? Do we want to be a preserving influence? Do we want to live for Jesus? And sometimes it's going to sting. Sometimes it's going to hurt. But it cleanses, salt cleans, right? Look what he says. He gives another example. You are the light of the world. Who is the light of the world? Those with the attitude of a broken heart and repentance. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. You are the light of the world. Listen, we know in our own lives when the salt is losing its savor, and we know in our own lives when the candle and the light's starting to go out. We know that. We need to rekindle that flame. We need to ask the Lord to make us salty again. Listen, we all have those first God saved experiences. When I first got saved, you know what? My light was shining bright. I thought I was going to convert everybody. I went to work. I worked for this, 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 this older Italian guy who owned a restaurant. I actually thought I was going to convert him in a day. And I'd go in and I'd start preaching to him. And I'd start preaching to him. And I'd start preaching to him. And then before I left, I'd close the store at night. I would write these Bible verses on the, on the menu board. It drove him crazy, right? Because my light was shining. I, and, and you know what? He didn't get converted. And I kept at it. And I kept at it. But little by little, I, I let the culture and the environment beat me down, and the light kind of went out. And that's what happens sometimes. We get going. We want to be used of God. We think God's going to do all these great things in our life, and he does, and he will. And what happens is God doesn't do what we think he's going to do, and next thing you know, we, de we develop wrong attitudes. Bitterness, resentment, anger. God, this isn't you know, as easy as I thought it was going to be. It's painful. What's going on? And the light starts to go out. That's why Jesus tells them, listen, let your light shine before men. You have to let it. You have to go to God and be honest with God. I have to go to God and be honest with God and say, God, you know what? My light's starting to go out. Jesus gives a simple illustration. What's the simple illustration? The simple illustration is no one lights a candle and puts it under a basket. Listen, if it was dark out, if we were doing you know, a Wednesday night service in the middle of the winter and the lights went out and we had a candle and I got up here, you know, we were going to try to sing some songs or read a little Bible verse or whatever. I got up here and I got a candle and I grabbed this bowl and I put the candle in, put the bowl on top of it, you'd say, what's this guy doing? <laughs> he's trying to start a fire, or is he, you know, is he, is he, no, he's actually putting out the light, the only light we have. He gives a simple illustration of the day. They didn't have incandescent light bulbs, they didn't have LED light bulbs, they didn't have fluorescent light, they didn't have that. They had candles to light the way, to light the houses. He goes, no one goes in their house gets home from working all day or doing whatever, it's dark out and lights a candle and goes it and puts it under a basket. Because they put it up high so it gives light to all the house. He gives that illustration about us. We need to let our light shine. 
We need to stand up for Jesus Christ. We need to make a difference. Remember, he said, you alone are the light of the world. You alone are the salt of the earth. Now listen, not just you alone here in this church. Those who really have an attitude of humility and repentance who belong to Jesus, they alone are the light of the world. But are we letting our light shine? Do we let our light shine? Now, what does that mean? How does that work? Some of us will run out of here and we'll say, well, Pastor Matt, what you, you know, if I'm going to let my light shine, you know, I got to go be a missionary to Africa, India. You know, it's to the Amazon basin, the Amazon valley. That's the only way I'm going to let my light shine. No, let your light shine right where you are. Right? If, you, if you're going to work every day and as you go to work, you know what? You go to lunch with your friends from work, 90% of them aren't saved, and they start talking about stuff that you know you're not supposed to be involved in, as much as it pains you, and you're going to probably be embarrassed, you say, hey, guys, you know, I just don't want to talk about that. If you guys are going to talk about that, I'm going to hang out over here for a little while. When you're done talking about that, I'll come back. <laughs> Go ahead and not. You guys are taking this Jesus stuff. You're taking this Jesus stuff a little too far now, really. Keep that Jesus stuff for Sunday morning church. Well, you're not. You're letting your light shine. You're letting your light shine. Letting your light shine doesn't mean you're going to run out of here and be the next Billy Graham. Some of you may. I don't know. But letting your light shine means standing up for Jesus, standing on the word of God. Standing up for Jesus, believing what the Bible says and trying to live it. Right? That's what letting your light shine is. Now listen. I'll be honest with you. Now this is my, these are my own faults and failures. And you know, some of you love that, so you can hold it against me. All right. I just finally got done working at Lowe's. Finally, I was down to 20 hours. Now I'm done. How I'm going to survive? Pray for me. All right. Because I was supposed to be full-time here, part-time there, but they were supposed to give me 10 to 15 hours the last year. They've been giving me 20 to 25 hours, and I can't do that. It's pulling too much for ministry. But over the past year, year and a half or so, even though I was working part-time, you know, I, while I'm at work, I'm doing all kinds of ministry work, right? I'm on the phone. I'm making text messages. I'm doing everything. You know what? And you're not supposed to do that. Now, listen. But I justified it because, hey, they gave, me, they gave me a list. I get more work done in 10 minutes than 10 associates do in 10 hours. So I justified it. You know, I'm getting all this work done, and I did. They were, they were appreciative of that. But God started to convict me. Well, you don't have the kind of job if you get your work done that you don't have to do more work. Because that's what they do. You get more work done, you do more work. You get, you get all this done, you do more. You get all this done, then they want you to do more. See, but it's not, it wasn't about them. It wasn't about getting work done. It was about my heart with the Lord. Because I can't see Jesus going to work, getting paid by the hour, right? Getting his work list done and then walking around doing ministry on his phone like this. So God convicted me month after month, month after month, month after month. You're going to walk by faith or not? You're going to trust me or not? Because you're starting to be a bad testimony. You're getting your work done. But it doesn't matter because they expect you to get more work done. So I finally had to come to a head and say, Lord, you know what? My light's not shining as much as it needs to shine. So I got to make, make a change here. See, that's at least trying to let your light shine. It doesn't mean you're going to go, God's going to send you over to Africa to be a missionary. It means right where you are, right where you're at, you can make a difference. That neighbor that keeps aggravating you, that's bothering you, that keeps, you know, letting his, you know, dog come over and go to the bathroom on your lawn, and you hate him, and you put up fences, and you curse him, and you do everything else, you know what? Maybe you tell him you're sorry. Maybe you pick up the dog crap for him. I don't know. <laughs> but that's letting your light shine. That's making a difference. 
And look what he says when we do that. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now listen, that doesn't mean that when people see you making a change for Jesus and doing something for Jesus or speaking up for Jesus, that everyone's going to say, hooray, everybody's going to get saved now. They're going to probably say you're nuts. They're going to probably say you're crazy. They're going to probably say, I don't want to hear about that. They're going to probably say, you know what? So what? So what if you're doing a little extra work on the side? So you can do Everybody does that. Everybody does it. That's what they're going to tell you. But it brings your heavenly Father glory. You know why? Because people see a difference. People see a change. Doesn't mean everyone's going to get saved. Some might. Some might say, hey, you know what? There's something different. There's something there. You know what? I want to know what that's all about. Someone's actually not living just for this world. They're living for something they believe is greater, eternity, that Jesus came to give us. Yeah. Are we letting our light shine? Are we letting it shine? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, he's teaching them about a relationship. Look what he says. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, they're all sitting there, right? This crowd, Jesus is on the mountainside. They're wondering, when's he going to get to the law? When's he going to get to the Ten Commandments? They're shocked. They're like, he's teaching us about a relationship with God. He's teaching us how we need to be used of God. He's teaching us that we're blessed if we want to be holy. He's teaching us all of this. And he's, they're wondering, what about the law? What about the law? What about the law? What about the commandments? And then he starts to teach them about a relationship. And they're wondering, we're not supposed to follow the law? And they're kind of confused. So he knows what's going on in their hearts. He knows what's going on in their minds. He's going to address the law. He goes, don't think that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For truthfully I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from this law till all be fulfilled. He goes, I want to tell you something. Every little jot and tittle of the law, of God's word, means something and it will be fulfilled. Picture it this way. He says jot and tittle. We put an I on the page in the English language. What he's saying is every little mock of the written word of God, an iota, that's where that word comes from, an iota, a little jot, a little tittle, every little bit of God's word will come to pass, will be fulfilled. He goes, I'm not sitting here telling you that God's law is not important. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now look what he says. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these, le the least of these commandments, shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now he addresses the Pharisees. And he addresses all the people. And he says, listen, you want to get into the kingdom of heaven? The Pharisees were there. He goes, you need to be more righteous than they are. At this point, everybody's saying, how? How? They're the ones who teach the law. They're the ones who know the law. They were the pastors, the shepherds of the day. Okay? They were the ones who were separated. But he tells the people, your righteousness, your holiness needs to exceed theirs if you're going to get into heaven. That's what he tells them. Now, if I'm a Pharisee, I'm sitting there saying, hey, he said something good about me, but he said something bad about me. Because basically he said, my righteousness isn't enough. I need to be more righteous than me. Does that make sense? Am I confusing you? Okay. You know what I'm saying, right? Okay. So basically he said, they're not getting in either. That's what he says. He goes, they teach the law. They try to keep the law. And let me teach you about the law is what he's saying. Now listen. Stay with me. He tells them your righteousness needs to exceed their righteousness. What does that mean? Because remember the Pharisees, they were pretty righteous. Really. 
They had carved up the law to 630 laws. Um, I had it written down here, 248 do's, 365 don'ts. Do this and don't do that. They were pretty. They had it, you know, law keepers. Listen, Jesus addressed them. Remember he said, he goes, you Pharisees, you go over land and sea to make one convert. But when you, when you make that convert, you make them twice the child of hell than you are. But like I said this to Lazarus, I'll say it again. At least they went over land and sea to make a convert. Okay? At least they were trying to be righteous. But the problem was because they thought because they were trying to be righteous, they actually thought they were, they, they were attaining righteousness. Understand? Kind of like the Christian who comes to church week after week. First he comes in, he or she gets saved. Oh Lord, I need you. I messed up my life. Thank you that there's a heaven. You know what? It's really all I have to live for. Oh, I screwed up everything on this world. Lord, just take me now. Forgive my sins. I need to go to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Next thing you know, they're going for a while. Jesus doesn't take them right to heaven. So they're going around and hey, they look around. Who are they going to look at? They're going to look at you. They're going to look at me. Because often they got to be taught to keep looking to Jesus. And then they walk around and they say, hey, I'm, I'll get a little bit more righteous if I carry a King James Bible. That's why I carry a King James Bible. All right? Then they look around and they say, hey, if I can do this, if I can perform that, if I can get to this, if I can go to that, then I'm a little bit more righteous. And then they keep adding to the list. And add into the list. And add into the list. And then they think, they wonder after a year or two, hey, God, you know what? I've been doing all this stuff. And how come, you know what? How come you're not answering more of my prayers? How come things aren't happening in my life more than I thought they were? Look at how righteous I am now. Look what I'm trying to do for you. Look at this. God just sitting up there in heaven saying, you're already righteous because I made you righteous. Because Jesus died. You don't have to earn anything. Now go to church and do those things out of love. Out of a heart of love. Out of a heart of obedience and out of a heart of love. And listen, the Pharisees are sitting there listening to this saying, he just said for anybody to go to heaven, everybody's righteousness has to be more than them. They're sitting there thinking, well, wait a minute, we're not in? We're the teachers of the law. Remember, Jesus talked about this. Remember, when you get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, when you get, listen, when you get to the end of it, you know what he says? <laughs> you know what they say about him? They say, hey, this guy actually knows what he's talking about. He teaches as if one, as if he has authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees. He's actually teaching us what the word of God really means, that we're supposed to have a relationship with God. And they were shocked. And the Pharisees are sitting there wondering. You know what Jesus says? Listen, get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. You know what he says? He goes, he who builds his life. His foundation on my sayings, I will liken him unto a man that builds his house on the rock. The storms come. And listen, in that context, he's talking about judgment. The judgment of God. The storms come, and they beat, and they pound. But you know what? If you build your life on the rock, when you stand before Christ, you're in with rewards. If you really don't know Christ, right? Listen, people come to church every week and the message will be about heaven, salvation, what true righteousness is and knowing Christ and love. And people come up and this is what they hear and this is okay. They'll come up and they'll say, hey, you know what? Can you pray for my, you know, my girlfriend? She, she, she broke up with me. Can she pray that she'll want me back? And I'll be like, well, okay. I'll, I'll pray for you, but do you know Jesus? That's what I'm trying to say. Seriously, this is the stuff that happens all the time, and I'm cool with that because they're in a broken state, and God's trying to get their attention, and he might use that girl or that guy, that breakup, to get their attention. That's what he used to get my attention. My girlfriend, that's now my wife, was going to leave me, and I said, no, no, no. <laughs> but Jesus got my attention. Now I love Jesus more than I love her. And now I love her more than I ever did then. But people come to church all the time and they'll hear these things and they'll come and say, oh, Pastor, you know, hey, can you pray for me? You know what, I'm, I, I, I lost my job and this and that. I'm like, well, do you know Jesus? Well, pray for me, I lost my job. I'm like, yeah, I heard that. I heard that, I get that. But do you know Jesus? I said, give your life to Jesus and let God work all that stuff out. Some people do, some people don't. 
By the time you get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, right, those who build their lives on the rock, when the storms of life come, when the judgment of God comes, you will stand. Those who build their life, listen, on the sand, when the storms come and the judgments come, you know what? Your house goes down. And know what Jesus said? Great is the fall of it. Now listen, great is the fall of it. Okay. You know, you know what's funny? I did a, um, I'm looking at this clock here. I did a, um, a vow renewal this past week, and they had a little gift for me. You know what the gift was? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> they told me to shut up a little quicker. I don't know. All right. We'll stop there.